So hello everybody, thank you for joining us on uh, this uh, Global Degrowth Day. So before starting, uh, I would like to thank the organizers of the Global Degrowth Day, but there will be a lot of events all around the world, and I think it's uh, fantastic. One more event about degrowth. Uh, last week, maybe some of you, uh, or most of you, uh, heard about the Vienna Degrowth Conference, or even participated in the online Vienna Degrowth Conference, which has been very, very successful. And uh, today we would like to have a short conversation about our forthcoming book, what we uh, made together with Anitra. Hello, Anitra. Hi, Vincent. Yeah. So Anitra is from Australia. Uh, she's speaking uh, from Australia. I am speaking from, uh, from Budapest today. And uh, it shows that how degrowth became quite international. And, uh, as we said uh, last week in the Vienna Degrowth Conference, it's a uh, good morning, good evening, good night, because we are people uh, following degrowth from uh, really all around the world. So it's, uh, it's very interesting to see uh, the dynamics around degrowth. And that's why we thought it's Danitra, and we are not the only ones, because there are a lot of uh, wonderful books which have just been published or which are about to be published also about degrowth. We thought it's very important to uh, to make the book what we are presenting today called Exploring Degrowth. So I will make a short introduction about why this book yeah. and what we tried to put in. After Anitra would reflect on what I present about the book uh, and after we will have a conversation around the book. So feel free to, uh, uh, during I speak and Anitra speaking, feel free to add comments, questions and so on. And we'll try to collect them from the chat. And as we are not so many, which is great, we can also give you the voice on microphone and video if you feel like happy to, to speak online. So let's start. So I had, uh, I've been involved in degrowth for uh, almost 15 years, which makes me quite, uh, quite, uh, quite old in the picture, but there are people who are even older in degrowth because then it's something we wanted to share and go back to the origin of degrowth while writing this book with Anitra because there is a history behind degrowth. And I could see how important it is in listening to a lot of discussion and debate of the Vienna Degrowth Conference last week. But what I can also observe in the discussion online or the articles published or even the attacks against degrowth, what we could see which are rising in the last week, in particular in this framework of, uh, of um, confinement and coronavirus crisis. And I think it's very important to go back to degrowth to go back to the origin of its pillars, its intellectual and theoretical pillars, but also of the history of the world, history of the, of, uh, of the movement and so on. Because degrowth, what is very interesting, that it's a radical debate, it's a radical uh, idea, so it takes the problem from the roots. It's very transdisciplinary and multidimensional and multilevel. And it makes it very consequent, very coherent very powerful, but it also creates a lot of misunderstanding. Uh, it's very difficult to keep in mind all the time, all the global picture about what is degrowth. And it's somehow what we try to do with Anitra in this book, to, um, to make a book which is relatively short. Uh, we hope readable and uh, accessible for a very large public. Going back to the origin of degrowth, and telling the story about what's happened, what was working, what failed, what was the positive impact, what were the limits, what were the misunderstanding, what were the debates. It opened starting from France in the beginning of the 2000s and maybe uh, even later from the 1960s, 70s or even later. I will come back on that in my introduction. And how this journey uh, went into a lot of different languages context, went into academics, went into a political debates, went into activist debates and so on, in political debates, and what degrowth bring on board, and why we think it's a very important and meaningful and powerful and effective platform uh, for conversation, for understanding much better the challenges that we face, uh, for implementing meaningful solution towards our thermo-industrial civilization, which has already started to, uh, to collapse. So I invite everybody to, uh, to close the microphone and uh, you will be able to talk later. So we, we have five parts in, in this book, which are somehow reflecting on the way I've been presenting degrowth in, 
in the last uh, decade, I, I made more than 500 talks on degrowth. So I keep on repeating the same somehow, even if the things are evolving. Uh, these five parts try to go back to uh, one dimension of degrowth. And it's what is very interesting in degrowth that each dimension is complementary to the other one. So degrowth is not only an academic field of research, degrowth is not only about economics, degrowth is not only uh, about voluntary simplicity, degrowth is not only about uh, radical political uh, movement, degrowth is all of that. And we start from the history of the world, and I would like to stop there a bit for a while because I could see that this story is not so much well known and this story is not so much understood. I could really feel it last week in, uh, in listening to a lot of workshop and discussion and debate in the Vienna Degrowth Conference. And, and we can really, really see it in, if you read the attacks or the discussion about degrowth in the last week on internet, like in the Financial Times, in a lot of media, on Twitter and so on. So it was maybe, and I really believe, a good idea to use such a provocative slogan which also creates a lot of misunderstanding. So the idea came from the meeting of mostly two groups of people in France in the beginning of 2000. On one hand, you have a group of old intellectuals, which were more in critiques to development dynamics around Professor Serge Latouche, for example. And um, in the same time, in 2002, they organized a very important uh, conference at UNESCO called Deconstruct Development, rebuild the world, or uh, yeah, destroy development, rebuild the world. And in the same time, a group of um, adbuster activists in Lyon, in the center of France, uh, started to read about sustainable development, started to read about environmental challenges, but uh, we face and we started to be a bit in the media as we started to speak in the beginning of the 2000s about climate change, biodiversity loss, and so on. Much less than what we do know, even if it's still not enough, but we started to do that. And they discovered, while reading all these things, a book written by Nicolas Georges Corogan, which was a collection of four books of Georges Corogan translated into French. And it was made in 1979. And in the beginning of the 2000s, these adbusters discovered this book. And the title of this book, which was given at that time in 1979, was Décroissance, which became later Degrowth in English. And decroissance was the wrong translation from decline, what Georges Kourogan used in his uh, writings in English, but Georges Kourogan accepted the translation into French. And the adbuster, including Vincent Chenet, who was uh, a bit the leader of this adbuster group, who used to be a marketing uh, professional and quit his job from uh, one of the biggest marketing corporations in France, understood that we need a powerful semantic tool, we need a powerful slogan to attack the ideology or even the religion of growth and to also avoid co-option, to avoid reappropriation of a new idea we should bring in this debate. And he got this wonderful idea to uh, use the slogan décroissance, which after became degrowth in English and was translated also in a lot of other languages, because it's something which, which is attacking uh, a lot of beliefs which are not so much questioned, which are more and more questioned, which were not at all questioned in the beginning of the 2000s. And growth is still in the center of all the debates. And the main goal of this slogan in the beginning was not to, de to decline or to degrowth, but was really to provocate, to invite us for a debate, to switch from an only reductionist quantitative approach of our model of society, which is based on growth for growth, which is based on a lot of uh, toxic concepts like economicism, like development, like uh, capitalism, uh, pro productivism, consumerism, techno-scientism, etc., etc. So to provocate a debate and to deconstruct a lot of beliefs, to be able, after debelieving, in French, we can play with that word, décroire and décroître, to debelieve and to, to degrow in order to uh, open our mindset, to decolonize our imaginary, and to construct a new narrative, to uh, construct a new models of society, which will be based on other type of values, which will be relocalized, but open and based on solidarity with open borders. We relocalize because we, it, it makes sense, which will be based also on a lot of other type of concepts, what Degros didn't invent, but Degros went to pitch a lot of old discussion, a lot of old debates, a lot of 
uh, all sorts, theories, philosophies, even spiritualities or tradition, what you can find in the past, what you can find in, uh, in the debates. And I think particularly about concepts like conviviality, to refer to uh, Ivan Illich conviviality concept, Tools for Conviviality is a wonderful book, and also all his thought about radical critics to consumerism, to developmentism, and so on. I, I refer to concepts like uh, ecofeminism. Uh, I think about Françoise Daubonne, a French woman who was one of the, of the mother of ecofeminism. So how to bring together a radical critiques of our model of society, which is based on a lot of domination. Of course, patriarchal, but also domination. And Black Lives Matters movement in the US is also reopening this debate, the domination based on um, uh, development and racism and xenophobia and uh, cultural imperialism coming from uh, the Western world and imposed to the rest of the world and so on. And of course, domination on the, on the mother earth, on the planet, with uh, extractivism, etc., etc. And I think also about concepts like autonomy, uh, referring to uh, Cornelius Castoriadis, uh, who was a radical critic to capitalism, but also questioning direct democracy, because degrowth is really about direct democracy. And I could have a lot, a lot, a lot of other concepts, but we try to define in the book. One more I would add is the radical critics to technoscientism. Science and technologies won't save us. They are also a part of the problem, and we have to address that um, in the degrowth approach and so on. So the book is about going back to the pillars of degrowth and how on these pillars, starting from a provocative slogan, going into a larger debate, connecting the dots with a, a lot of ideas, a lot of theories, a lot of debates, understanding the history of how we ended up here, understanding the history of capitalism, of productivism, of progress, of development, and so on, how we can deconstruct a lot of toxic concepts to make step aside and to start to be liberated, open our minds, and to construct new utopias, new worlds, and so on. And the second part of the book, after starting to define the pillars, is more about what could be degrowth in, act, in action. There are already a lot of wonderful things happening around degrowth, around the fourth political levels of degrowth, individual, collective, um, politics, and the project. Also, what could be, and it was in the heart of the debate last week in Vienna, and I saw a lot of misconception, a lot of misunderstanding, a lot of uh, things which are still to be constructed. So we tried to uh, uh, propose a political strategy for degrowth based on rethinking our approach toward power. So how to change the world without taking the power? Because if you take the power, you're taken by the power, but without abandoning it either. So the main goal is not to let it in the hands of Viktor Orban or Emmanuel Macron or, or Donald Trump or whoever, but how to construct a type of movement based on counter power anti-power. It's also connected to the idea of ecofeminism or the idea of uh, pluriversalism, how to construct a world where conflictuality in politics would be constructed differently based on nonviolent communication, identifying where are the conflicts and how based on direct democracy we can solve this conflict. And also speaking about this strategy, we try to uh, propose some main lines of what could be a political degrowth agenda, what could be a political project for degrowth. And uh, for that, we go back to something that we uh, co-developed in the French degrowth movement, bringing also a lot of other ideas, which have been developed in the last years in, uh, in the degrowth networks, which became international and which became very amazing. There are now uh, hundreds of uh, uh, young academics, activists, uh, whoever working on degrowth. And it's really, really uh, wonderful to see all the debates around. So we go back to... Uh, the idea of unconditional autonomy allowance coupled with a maximum income. And this idea of unconditional autonomy allowance is trying to bring together the idea of uh, unconditional basic income. So to give from birth to, uh, to death individually, unconditionally, what is considered as enough to have a decent life, to connect it to uh, unconditional basic services, to connect it to something which is more difficult for me to translate into English, what we call gra gratuity, so to make for free what we consider is too important to let in the end of the market. It's connected to the idea of the commons, how to rethink another type of uh, governance for the common, which will also radically criticize the idea of 
property right, how to question property right when it goes against the um, living together, social and environmental justice, and so on. And also to connect it with the idea of a local economic system, like local currencies, like a time bank, uh, like reciprocity economy, and so on. So in this book, and I think uh, it's really what we try to do, and I think it's really my approach of degrowth since I am involved in the movement, it's what I love. And I think degrowth makes sense where we always manage to bring together all these ideas and to create a narrative in connecting the dots and understand very well that all this discussion from very theoretical or academic work, questioning conviviality or autonomy, is meaningful if you connect it with a, a community garden, if you connect it with the implementation of a local currency, you connect it with a political debate about uh, um, about public debt and private debt and about uh, money, crea money creation and so on. If it, makes, uh, it makes sense if you connect it also with uh, uh, this provocative slogan, degrowth, which cannot be emptied from its content, it cannot be reappropriated, and uh, which is always pushing us to go further and further and deeper and deeper into the debate, uh, to uh, be able to uh, emancipate our thoughts, to make a step aside, and reappropriate new utopia. So um, I stop here with a very short introduction. I know I invite Anitra from Australia to, uh, to bring us thoughts about uh, this wonderful common journey we went through together. Anitra, the floor is yours. Thanks very much. Yes, look, I think that one of the biggest difficulties that I have here in Australia, uh, where degrowth is less well known than in Europe, is that people automatically think that growth and degrowth are on a kind of quantitative spectrum. Whereas what I try and um, explain is, is that degrowth is to growth as quality is to quantity. We might think that growth is, uh, is new, um, but in fact, in terms of uh, degrowth, degrowth is very much about quality. Um, so those, that's one of the main difficulties um, that I have with, um, with explaining about, um, about degrowth and growth. Uh, the other thing that I think is also confusing for people um, is that we seem to have a problem with uh, just a moment. Let me just see if that works. Yeah. Okay. Um, are you getting a um, video for me? Yeah. You are, okay then, sorry. It was just that it, it had stopped my end. So um, the other thing is, is, is that degrowth is purposely provocative in a variety of ways. And I think a lot of people find that kind of quite confronting. They want a kind of solution. They, and, and I actually really love the way that degrowth refuses to give that solution because Degrowth is very much about autonomy, about democracy, about direct democracy. It is not about one person telling another person. It's about us discussing everything and working out where we want to go. And especially at the moment where we face the massive environmental crises and social crises, and I really love the way that um, Vincent, you always emphasise that inequality is a first principle of degrowth, is approaching and deconstructing inequality and making people, everyone have their basic needs be met, that this is absolutely crucial and it's as crucial as thinking about the environment. Um, so... Those are the sorts of things I think are very important. Um, I think it's also important to say that the degrowth book has been formed, its shape uh, took place 
partly from the publisher's point of view, putting out this new series called Fireworks. They um, ask people to write short books that explain a particular concept such as degrowth. Uh, and also at the same time, reveal a kind of angle about it. So it might be a different way of looking at, uh, at, at a particular kind of concept, or it might be um, an angle that comes from a particular person's broader perspective. Our innovation when it came to degrowth was to recognise that we didn't think that there was enough that was written about degrowth as a movement, about the actual activism of degrowth. And I really like the way, Vincent, when you wrote the first draft, we had, we sort of built up to the third chapter, which creates spheres of looking at what degrowth activism, how degrowth activism unfolds. And essentially those spheres are looking at the way that someone can work in their own personal life through reflection and action to act and embody degrowth, act in degrowth ways. But how limited that is, that very personal sphere, and how we move on and work as collectives. And then we move on yet again, and something that you very much brought out when you talked about the ad busters and the intellectuals who started and made visible degrowth in the early 2000s, is resistance because I think that a lot of the first years of degrowth as far as I can see was a lot about resistance, resistance to mega developments, resistance to um, advertising and uh, resistance to transport such as cars, all of these sorts of things. Protesting is one side of it, the construction side of it, the experimentation, I think has really come into its own as it has with other 21st century movements during the 2010s. Um, so we also look at the sphere then of degrowth as a movement, which to a large extent, I think has been spelled out through the international degrowth conferences. And again, if you go to degrowth.info as a kind of hub where lots of information is about degrowth, about degrowth events, about degrowth books coming out and whatever. And uh, then that sort of enables us to talk more about strategic questions. One of the things that I um, think could be really useful um, to talk about, Vincent, is the resistance um, within the French degrowth movement to the kind of collapsology. Do you want to talk about that? About well, collapsology. So, yeah, it's a, it's, it's a movement, I mean, in France, it's a movement which started in the middle of 2000s, and uh, it's very interesting because uh, somehow they didn't invent so much. They just collect all the information we already had from maybe the 1960s about the fact that we are running to the wall, that our economic system is driving our civilization to a collapse, and they created a theory of of collapsology, of collapse of our civilization. But they failed to, to move forward. They stayed in the catastrophism. They stayed in a liver which is only somehow emotional. And maybe it's what Degros sometimes lacked. We got too much rational and too much political and so on. And they failed in, um, in, in, in staying on this emotional dimension and unable to uh, create dynamics to to move and to self-organize yourself to, uh, to do something. 
And it became very popular in the medias, in particular in France. And somehow Degros has been kicked out from the mainstream media and was substituted around 2015 by Collapsology uh, because it's, it's, it participated in depoliticizing the debate, exactly what Degros always tried to, to avoid. When we started with Degros, we understood that we are about to have more and more and more debates and more and more problems with the environmental limits we started to flirt with. And in the beginning of the 2000s, we started to speak about climate change, but it was not the main issue in the debates and so on. And in the same time, we started to see how the dominant system through sustainable development, through, and I will also reflect on the word degrowth, why I think it's very important, through the implementation of a lot of new slogans, one after the other one. So we heard about green growth, we heard about smart, inclusive growth, we heard about uh, uh, fair trade, organic, pro organic products, a lot of new slogans, a lot of new adjective ads after development, after progress, after growth and so on, in order to always empty the debate uh, from the political dimension which is necessary. And degrowth created in the beginnings and in Australia the same misunderstanding. People first understood degrowth as, or decroissance as the contrary to a growth. And to degrow for degrow is as stupid than to grow for grow or growth for sake of growth. And, um, and uh, on the contrary, we could see after almost 20 years in France that the only world which was not co-opted, which was not emptied from its content, from all our green, uh, left, progressive, emancipatory, whatsoever movements, was degrowth. Even conviviality has been, been co-opted by the advertisement. Green is totally reappropriated by green social washing. Uh, sustainable development, nobody dares to use it so much anymore as it's been so much discredited to sell everything in its country. Degrowth is intellectually pushing you to an effort to go behind, behind the world. You will be first shocked, you will be first uh, disturbed or even angry with people supporting this idea to implement recession. So you will be pushed to go further. And you cannot be quicker than the music, as we say in French. I don't know if you say it in English. So you need time to go to deconstruct a lot of concepts and so on. And unfortunately, Collapsology was one more new tool used by the system to put in the front to speak about something you couldn't um, deny anymore because it was more and more obvious for the people that climate change is here, biodiversity loss is here, a lot of challenges with environmental limits are here. So collapsology was used to say, yeah, it's here, but it will happen. And the, the title of the, the main book about collapsology in France was Everything Will Collapse, which is a type of depoliticizing title. It will collapse, so let's go home and do something else. It will happen. Well, it won't happen like that. And Degros, that's really the question, facing these limits, how do we democratically organize it? I would even say self-organize it. How do we prepare for the upcoming crisis or the crisis which is already here? And there we have this slogan, chosen degrowth or imposed recession. And in this time of confinement, we could see uh, how recession or lack of growth in an economic model or even in a society designed for growth for growth is a tragedy. So our main goal is really to go out of our growth dependencies and to invent new models of society which won't be based on quantitative indicators because you cannot measure happiness, you cannot measure enjoyment of life, you cannot measure meaningful lives or activities and so on, but more on qualitative, complex debates, deliberation and decision about what are our basic needs and how do we fulfill these basic needs in a sustainable, desirable, just, fair ways. We already started to collect some questions. Could you have a look at it? Uh... Yes, so Ari is asking, uh, he's with the, Ari's with the um, Climate Action and Justice Movement in Denmark, and they're having a weekend seminar on degrowth. 
uh, for the first time. And um, they're wondering about what groups uh, like them can incorporate from degrowth. And the, I suppose the kinds of things that I think of immediately are some of the things that you've just spoken about. And that is, is, is that um, degrowth is very much about imagining degrowth, post-growth sorts of futures and very much into experimenting with ways of living that deeply respect the earth. And so that the kinds of problems um, as I see it with um, the environment, the global environment, um, carbon emissions are really just the tip of the iceberg of environmental crises that, as I see it, have been created by capitalist sorts of activities. And so imagining other ways that we can um, provide for ourselves is very important at the same time as protesting and trying to get governments to bring in regulations. Uh, and the justice is absolutely critical in terms of climate. And that is what I think that degrowth is very strong on as well. I would like to, to add something on that based on my experience, because in, a, in the beginning of degrowth movements, such uh, climate action and justice movements, uh, or typical green movements and so on, uh, were quite conflict, conflicting toughly with degrowth. And uh, things changed a lot in the last years. And for example, I've been working with uh, Greenpeace, uh, which started to understand that to fight to only fight uh, against pollution, to only campaign uh, about environment and so on, without bringing into the picture a much more systemic narration, systemic support, um, is going nowhere. Because you will face type of cooptation, you will face type of contradictions. Like if you don't question the system in its own, and you fight for more social and uh, environmental justice, um, you will still rely on this imposture of green growth. You will still rely on uh, trying to keep on doing the same in greening it, and it will bring a lot of contradiction. And somehow the debates we had with Greenpeace and a lot of other movements, and we, we did it also in Hungary with uh, uh, Extinction Rebellion and so on, and also with Greenpeace, because tomorrow I will organize a workshop with Greenpeace on degrowth the regional Greenpeace movements and degrowth. And uh, it makes their life more difficult for this movement because they were used to have more like uh, activist slogan, which are usually simpler than only degrowth. I mean, degrowth is easy to say, but behind it's much more complex. It's, and, but you need to connect the dots. And I think um, what is important within the degrowth networks, and I need to try to say the movement, but it's a debate we could have later on. We, we already have, and I have with a lot of people among degrowth. I don't speak anymore about the degrowth movement. I speak about degrowth networks in plural, mm -hmm. because there is a large diversity, and, and we try to, to keep on, to keep this self-organized, horizontal, decentralized, uh, with different levers, different spheres, different uh, strategies on board. And what makes sense for such movements uh, climate action, justice movement, and so on. What makes sense to keep a connection with the degrowth networks, to have people who are one step more in degrowth, one step more in uh, more direct action, uh, people, I mean, to bring the debate all the time. And, uh, and I think degrowth is really this type of umbrella uh, platform, I, I would call platform, which is connecting the dots, which is connecting a lot of people, which is connecting a lot of problems and so on. If you speak about climate action, you will need to connect with unions because like you have, we have to, to close a lot of very polluting industry, but it has to be done with the unions on what to address to the employees of this industry. We need to go out of a society organizers around employment to go to a society organized around emancipatory uh, activities. So it's something which, which brings also this debate and you need the connection with the unions. Um, it also requires some political dimension. So uh, how do we deal with closing the polluting industry with an economic system which is uh, addicted to growth? We are closing the industry 
is creating recession. So you need to redesign the economic system. You need to rethink the economic system and, and so on and so on. So degrowth is a, uh, bringing to this type of movements, which starts from their uh, main point of consent, is bringing the connections to starting from this concern to bring a much wider coherent narrative in connecting the dots and in connecting it or trying to connect it with a lot of other people facing other problems which are totally complementary because we are not facing uh, several crises in our society with economic crisis, unemployment, environmental crisis, etc. Uh, etc. Et it's a crisis of a model of civilization based on always more, based on oil and based on, on on, on an imaginary and so on. And you, not to, you have to connect all these dots to be able to create even more resistance and to be able to implement solutions which are meaningful, taking into account this different level and this large diversity of, of challenges we face. One of the things that um, I also find that a lot of people ask me is how can we have uh, all of the wonderful uh, high-level, high-tech medicine if we live in a degrowth world. And as someone who's actually been seriously ill at times um, and with things that doctors can see that you actually have something wrong with you but actually don't know what it is, I'm extremely sceptical number one, of high-tech solutions. I know that a lot of treatments have a lot of really awful side effects. I think that the kinds of societies that we live in, capitalist societies, um, mean that prevention is, uh, is, is, is not only, not only is the system sort of blind to prevention, um, but prevention is one of the biggest things um, which would enable us to live more healthily. And um, yeah, so I wondered if you had anything else to add to that. I always kind of think of uh, people like um, Lafargue, who used to, who wrote that wonderful book um, on the right to be lazy, but he was a doctor. And after losing three, his three children, he decided um, that he would become a revolutionary because uh, that was the way that he would actually be able to save lives. And it was similar with Che Guevara. So, um, yeah. Yeah, it's interesting. Lafarge was also the son-in-law of uh, Karl Marx. And mm -hmm. uh, they had tough debates. Um, no, but medicine, so we, are, we have a small chapter, not chapter, paragraph about Paul Lafargue, I think, and we reflect on that. And also, uh, we have a, a longer chapter about degrowth and health and degrowth and medicine. And, and we refer a lot to uh, Nemesis Medical, uh, Ivan Illich book, which is maybe sometimes demagogic and very provocative. But I think uh, including in particular after the coronavirus or COVID-19 we've just experienced. Um, I think degrowth has to open this debate on health, on uh, our relationship with the disease, our relationship with the limits, our relationship with death. And um, we've just published in French a quite a provocative paper with my uh, French co-authors about what COVID-19 crisis revealed about our gross society, our gross imaginary, and what it represents in denying our limits, in denying death. We also quote in this article Bernard Maris, who was a um, heterodox French economist close to degrowth, and he was shot to death in the Charlie Hebdo terrorist attack in 2015. And Bernard Maris was also very interested in, uh, in psychoanalysis, and he made this analysis about capitalism, about growth, that it's an unconscious, uh, morbid uh, race after immortality. You try to accumulate always more and more goods. You try to, uh, to work always more and more, to hope to have enough when you reach death, to buy immortality. 
And to about the question of health, which is bringing the question of technologies, which is bringing the question of high tech, low tech, which is bringing the question on uh, our, uh, about the ecofeminism and the logic to dominate the nature, to live with the nature, uh, which is bringing the question of extractivism, which is bringing a lot of question behind capitalism and what Degros is bringing. It's to rethink our relationship about, uh, about the limits, to rethink our relationship about accepting or not accepting, which can be like a provocation, death, and to understand that we are here on earth to enjoy some time from birth to death. And what do we want to do with this time? It's also George's, what George Corrigan asked. And not to fall into uh, uh, this race of technology, like uh, George Corrigan also had this uh, funny sentence about uh, uh, you call it the shaver to shave your face. That to, you need to shave yourself in the morning. I mean the men. And uh, so to shave yourself, you 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 waste some time somehow. You have to spend half an hour to shave every morning. So you will use your free time to develop a much more effective shaver. And you manage to save some time in shaving yourself quicker. But you never stop because the free time you just manage to get, you will use it to find something which will be even more effective. And the question of the limits, the growth society, and also about technology, innovation, low tech, high tech, and health, it's where do you stop? Because we can spend our whole life to increase our health and to spend all our free time to increase our health without enjoying the free time. And here are a lot of questions about, uh, about that. And to, to conclude in our article, the title was, uh, we are all sick of COVID-19, that facing virus, hopefully it was not the most violent virus. Virus is a part of us. I mean, uh, uh, like Macron's president, and I think Orban said something similar in Hungary. Macron says that we are in war against the virus. Well, we are not in war against the virus. We should accommodate with the virus because we are both part on nature. and. Uh, uh, facing the virus, we apply the type of very reductionist uh, politics where we started to stop everything without thinking, to, to design how the virus can develop based on the number of available beds we had in, uh, in uh, intensive care in hospitals. And we created even more problem because we were, like when we speak about growth, unable to think what Degros is inviting us to do in complexity. Not all, and we had to listen to the doctors. We had to take care about how many sick people we have to handle and what our capacity to handle that. But we had to do it also taking into account a, a lot of other things. What to do with the side effect of confinement. What to do with the people who are abandoned alone. What to do with the women which are closed in a flat and beaten all day long and so on. And we were unable to think in this whole complexity. And now we inherited from these weeks of confinement a health situation which is maybe worse than the coronavirus on its own or COVID-19 on its own. And we also inherited the economic situation where we don't know what to do, but to try to relaunch the economy, what we stopped for a few weeks, which is quite unlikely to happen without uh, a catastrophe because uh, um, this period reinforced in a tragedy uh, the inequalities which are already strong b before the crisis and even worse during the crisis and even worse after the crisis. And Degros, for us, with what we've just lived, it's a very interesting time to reflect on Degros and how important it is to face a problem not in a narrow reductionist way, not only with one problem, but in a much more complex, uh, multidimensional way. And I think that if we look at open relocalization, if we look at the um, very strong emphasis um, in degrowth on localizing economies, it's much easier now for me to speak to people and argue why localizing economies is useful and works so well. Um, it's in the pandemic, people suddenly realized exactly what the, the um, dependence and reliance on these massively long chains 
um, that globalized capitalism um, has created means when they need something and it's a basic need and they can't get it, sometimes within their own nation, let alone their own region. And degrowth works very hard to relocalize or localize all economies so that we might be able to meet our basic needs in the local area. And I think that the pandemic uh, would be very much more just a health concern if we had a proper post growth uh, economy and society than the, all of the economic complications um, that people um, are address, having to address because we have a global production system and a global distribution system. And this is also one of the big problems with inequity. If we've got localised economies, I think that we can meet people's needs and we can see that people who are homeless, we can actually address those things if we're looking just in our local area and to find the solutions in our local area. Yeah, to, to reflect on that, when we, we started to speak about open relocalization, it was on one hand to relocalize, which makes sense based on what Anitra said uh, just now. And uh, also it, we really insisted on the adjective open before. And I even speak about solidarity and open relocalization because we could see in this time of pandemics how the world has been globalized and how we are depending all on somebody else, on a region, on the other part of the world and so on. And why making this relocalization, you will need type of cooperation. Also, we are about to face uh, more and more catastrophes. Uh, we could, when we were in the heart of the writing of the book, there were these uh, huge fires in, uh, in, uh, in Australia. So all along the book, we went through a lot of big events around us and so on. So you need this type of open relocalization to create local resilience, to create local solidarity, to create uh, autonomy locally and so on. But you also need to understand that you will need to have solidarity with other parts of the world. If there is a, a tough drought in Australia or in Hungary, we will need support from other people during the time of drought. If there is another catastrophe in another part of the world, we will need the support and the solidarity uh, about, uh, about, uh, about that. And uh, also, I would like to add something about this idea of relocalization. Like we, we were very critical in France with the rise of, um, among our left uh, France, the rise of concept of protectionism. And um, we didn't really like the war because we don't have to protect from the other people. We need to, to be solidar and so on. But also to be localized. And we could see that it was a wonderful, tough, uh, uh, empiric experimentation during the time of confinement. And when the borders closed, um, we could realize how we live in an illusion of freedom to consume whatever we want to consume anytime. And behind this, illusion of freedom when you go to a supermarket or even you go on internet and you order something and it's delivered to your place in a few hours and so on behind that there is a mega machine which is relying on oil which is relying on a lot of exploitation which is relying on a lot of destruction of environment and so on which which is also very fragile and to relocalize it's to make us again conscious about what do we consume because consume because if it's produced locally by ourselves, we wouldn't accept to exploit children. We wouldn't accept to, uh, to uh, destroy the environment, to have a, uh, a lot of devices, a lot of products that we consume every day because we are never facing the impact, the human and environmental impact of these co consumptions because it's happening somewhere far in the planet and so on. So to relocalize, it's also to enlighten our decision and to go more and more to a uh, direct democracy about what do we produce, how, for what kind of use. We've got um, some questions here. One about strategies for transformation. And of course, I do see open relocalization as a very um, powerful strategy for transformation. Um, but in the book, we talk quite a bit about 
cultural revolution. Um, the question is a little bit focused on the political level, um, but we need to unpack that in terms of how degrowth actually sees politics um, rather than as hierarchical and in terms of policies, but seeing it in terms of the power of individuals and communities to work at the grassroots level. Yeah, it's, uh, we speak about how to change the world without taking the power. And uh, uh, the first step is to go to uh, a cultural hegemony. And I think we are closer and closer in most of the Western countries and also in a lot of parts of the world. We are closer to a type of cultural hegemony around ideas defended by degrowth. And uh, the first level degrowth should act, it's on the cultural level. And confinement where people had to slow down. Um, confinement was a, a type of wonderful tool to decolonize our imaginary. Suddenly we, we, could, we could slow down because we live in a society like the hamster in the wheel, which has to always run quicker and quicker and quicker. And time of confinement pushed maybe most privileged people, but a large part of the society also, to slow down and to reflect and to reflect on what really matters. From one day to another one, we could see what is totally useless and what really matters and what's the most important in our life. We could also start to see what kind of task in our society are the most important. We are marketing, uh, tax evasion, uh, a lot of jobs like that stop, but the society was still going on because the nurses, the care work employees, uh, the people caring about the waste, uh, the local food producers, the bike messenger bringing the food to your home and so on, were still working to make the life still going on. We could also see how important is education. Uh, where a lot, I have a lot of right-wing uh, friends who were always complaining how lazy are the teachers. But when they end up at home, eight hours making the school with the children and, and so on, they realize that it's not such an easy job and so on. So we could start to understand what really matters and so on. So degrowth really starts from this cultural transformation, moving to uh, uh, how in my habits I can start to change step by step my habits. What do I consume? Should I use my car or my bike? Uh, what kind of food do I eat? Uh, how do I travel? And I'm still taken into this trap of uh, uh, mass tourism, take an airplane every week and so on, because it's the only thing that the society is offering to me. How can I go to zero waste, to share, to reuse and so on? Also, how I can co-construct together in my territories uh, local utopias, local concrete alternatives around community supportive agriculture, urban agriculture, local economic system, uh, transition, uh, transition tone, transition network. There are a lot of wonderful initiatives everywhere and how to join it and to develop or to co-construct the pillars in experimenting of what could be a Digo society tomorrow. And parallelly to that, you have the resistance uh, I think we need to resist, in particular in this time where the mainstream dominant systems try to go back to what they call normal, try to relaunch the economy. So we need to, res to resist against that. And we need also to be active politically and to bring a political agenda. So I see a question about uncondi unconditional basic income, maximum income, how to uh, rethink money creation, our economic system, open debates about public debt, private debt, um, invent new local economic system, local currencies, could be a lot of different types of local currencies, time bank, uh, to maybe promote more and more informal solidarities through a reciprocity economy and, and so on. So there are a lot, a lot, a lot of dimension of degrowth as a political agenda. And it's really how to change the world without taking the power. So to have one step in the system, there are degrowth people participating in elections. Like in France, we have a, a lot of friends involved in the municipal election. I think the municipal uh, level is a very good level to politically act for degrowth. Um, but we should be somehow everywhere to resist and to invent new ways to make politics. And something which, which is quite inspiring, and I will stop here if I'm, I see that I'm interesting, that I'm a bit too long. Uh, in France, Following the Yellow Vest movement, there was an experimentation pushed by Yellow Vest and some uh, uh, degrowth friends to um, have uh, 
public deliberation with 100 people which were picked by chance among the French population. And they met regularly every weekend and reflect on what could be the solution to what climate change and uh, social justice, social environmental justice. And they've been working based on deliberation and so on, and they are now about to produce their recommendation. And it's unbelievable how it is on the agenda of uh, political, of uh, degrowth politics. And I really believe in direct democracy. Based on my experience, if you give the right uh, framework to people to sit and reflect on what really matters, you don't end up with 5G, you don't end up with electric car or autonomous electric car, you don't end up with uh, uh, nuclear power plants and everything, you usually end up with good sense, local, resilient, autonomous, convivial, democratically appropriatable solution for the people to fulfill a type of um, a simple uh, way of life which makes sense for the people. So it's really about direct democracy. Yeah, so someone um, has also raised um, the fact that um, what about the sort of dynamics between uh, global north and global south or majority minority world and um, I suppose reparation for historic injustices um, and asking is this possible under the degrowth movement? I mean, I suppose my um, jumping off point for, for answering that would be that I can't see how we can in fact remedy these historic injustices without us stop taking, you know, such a big part of the pie. And, and in many ways, what I find really interesting is, is that degrowth can be found a lot in the global south. So that it's something we can learn from the global south. It's not us giving, giving something. We've been sort of imperialising too much, the global south. Um, was there anything more that you'd like to add to that? Yeah, to, to reflect and, uh, and very often, and uh, for example, in, um, it was somehow missing in a lot of debates I, I, I was participating in in Vienna Degrowth Conference. We forget that one of the main and maybe one of the most fundamental pillar on which degrowth has been built is radical critics to development. And uh, development, as uh, uh, if you go back to, uh, to uh, the history of development, it really started with Harry Truman speech to the nation in 1949, where the West started to create this Im culturally imperialistic narrative that there are countries which have developed us and there are countries which has to be developed, follow the same pathway. And on the contrary, Degros is speaking about pluriversalism. And, uh, and I think Degros has to be constructed with and for the global south. And it has to be constructed by the global north because there is no uh, opportunity and no chance for the global south to reappropriate their self-determination, whatever they want to do, if we don't degrow up our one by environmental footprint in the global north. If we don't decrease radically all the technical, uh, from a human and environmental and resource point of view, uh, um, technical help they keep on giving us. And I think about the book, I'm afraid it's not translated into English, but it's mentioned in, in our book, I think. It's, the title is uh, Hidden Depth of Economy. It's about the environmental debt and all the human debt. I could also quote uh, Animata Traore from, uh, from uh, the ex-minister of, uh, of uh, culture of Mali, wonderful woman, alter globalist woman, which on the side of Degros, and she said that the worst of colonization of development was the rape of their imaginary. So we need to engage into a dialogue about that. And I think it's about cooperation where we have to listen a lot to them. We have a lot to learn from them. If you think about all civilization which are still alive, uh, I guess we have a lot to learn about them because they manage without destroying their environment and themselves to survive or to live a happy life for uh, centuries, where us with our civilization in 
less than 200 years, we jeopardize the possibility uh, of our children just to have a decent life on this planet. So we have to be humble. We have to deconstruct our dependency on them and to co-construct solutions together in listening to them. And I think that's one of the most important aspects of it being an open relocalization as well. Because if we're looking at localizing our economies, we're actually looking at resettling the earth so that we are we have populations in regions that can support them. And I think that we have to be very open to mobility in along the terms of what Earth and in Earth in particular regions can support. Um, so that's another aspect um, of Global South and Global North is actually um, seeing that we go beyond sort of national boundaries and we see international and universal kinds of responsibilities as well as rights. Um, yes. Uh, but there is I, a quick, yeah. Also, the, the um, aspect of the uh, universal basic income as being too tied to growth is a very good question. Um, and in the book, I think it's uh, really interesting the way that um, the unpacking of the um, unconditional autonomy allowance is to see um, an unconditional basic income that could actually be supplied in kind. It doesn't have to be a monetary um, uh, offering. It, 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 it's not like a universal basic income as being a certain amount of money for people, but rather that everyone has the right to their basic needs being met. And if at a certain point in history, especially early on, that means that you need to have some money, okay. But really what we're looking at is um, seeing people's um, demands being met immediately and in the locality. So when we produce things, we actually know who they're going to. It's not a matter of a monetary flow or people having an income that they can offer um, for their basic needs. Yeah, I totally agree with uh, what Anitra just said. And, uh, and I will add a more global um, way of thinking from uh, Digo's point of view, because uh, uh, in the French degrowth movement, in the beginning, the French degrowth movement was divided in favor of against unconditional basic income. So the one who were in favor of unconditional basic income somehow reappropriated the tool to design it as a tool which could be useful for a degrowth project. And the one who were against unconditional basic income uh, underlined, and they were right, the danger of unconditional basic income, which could be a wonderful tool for a neo neoliberal political agenda, which could also be a wonderful tool for a relaunch Canadian political agenda to recreate growth and employment and so on, type of employment we don't want anymore and so on. And um, we ended up to find a type of compromise or consensus on basic income uh, in putting the question on the table in a different way. And very often, and it's also a Western way of thinking, when you go into a question, are you in favor or against something, you end up with unmeaningful debates because you will have a lot of people who will be in favor for good reason, as you will have people who will be against for good reason and the contrary. And the main question shouldn't be in favor or against. The main question should be to do what? And an unconditional basic income is only a tool, like a lot of other tools, like to erase the public debt, like to reappropriate money creation, like um, uh, we are speaking about low tech, high tech, and uh, medicine. Maybe some high tech for some type of things would be useful for us. But it's not in favor or against high tech or low tech, it's to do what? And the same is unconditional basic income. It's, it's how we develop the project, and it's also a tough debate. We've been having for years with the French movement of unconditional basic income, which step by step moved to our our um, degrowth project approach, because in the beginning, as they were mostly all of them young for an emancipatory and conditional basic income, 
for social justice, more left, more green, and so on, it was obvious that they defended this idea for meaningful purposes. And we pushed them to say that don't defend unconditional basic income, but put unconditional basic income as a tool which could be effective in certain condition with a certain usage for a political project. And, uh, and um, it's what we tried to do and it's how we connected unconditional basic income with degrowth. Uh, we didn't call it anymore only unconditional basic income, but uh, we added the word autonomy. So we, we built it on the logic of autonomy coming from Castoriadis and the logic of direct democracy. We demonetarize the basic income because we put on board the logic of uh, public services because unconditional basic income could drive our society to totally dismantle. And we could see in this period of coronavirus how the public uh, services has been dismantled in our neoliberal uh, societies and economies. So public services, we put on board the logic of, uh, uh, of the commons, which is also connected to direct democracy. Uh, the logic of decommodification of life. We also put on board the logic of limits with maximum income. And, uh, and then unconditional basic income makes sense and could be effective as a pathway, as a step toward a degrowth, uh, degrowth society. Would you like to talk a little bit about Kagonomia? and how it started and how that demonstrates. I mean, because what I think this is really good is, is, is that it shows people um, what, all, what a strategy is in the sense in practice and a prefigurative model. Wow. It can be long and... Uh, <laughs> uh, no, we are lucky because in Budapest we could initiate uh, an interesting project which started uh, officially five years ago. We should have celebrated our fifth anniversary and uh, we had to postpone or to cancel because of COVID-19, so we wanted to organize a large party. And, uh, but years ago, we did something and we were very lucky to be in this... Um, already existing wonderful ecosystem with a lot of initiatives, a lot of creativity, a lot of decommodified and, uh, and uh, a lot of uh, uh, based on reciprocity and formal solidarities uh, initiatives all around Budapest. And with a group of friends, we decided to uh, build on what was already working, even more synergies and cooperation. And we connected together uh, a bike shop, which started to create and, and uh, make cargo bikes, uh, a new social cooperative, which was a cargo bike, bike messenger company, an organic farm next to Budapest, uh, an organic bakery, which was just starting in Budapest and so on. And we started to together initiate some cooperation. And uh, we speak about the degrowth model, because we decided from the beginning uh, to don't make any loan, to don't invest any money, but to start with what we are able to do with the people we know, with our network, with our things, and based on that, to step by step, uh, not to grow, but to reinforce the quality of the interaction, to reinforce the solidarities, to reinforce the, <coughs> the diversi diversification of our know-hows and to share it. Uh, to rethink the commons and so on. And step by step, we constructed more and more uh, complementary projects in reappropriating more and more common tools, which could be a network, which could be a Facebook page, communication skills, uh, farming skills, how to make a cargo bike, and also more tools, like we have some facilities to organize events and do things. We have some um, uh, uh, tools to repair bikes or to make gardening. We have a lot of things like that. And the idea is to um, try to experiment in a small scale in a city like Budapest, a lot of informal solidarities and to analyze how powerful it is. And it's difficult to analyze that because in our society, if you don't have a bill, if you don't have a contract, it's not calculated into the GDP and it's something which is uh, uh, not existing. So we try to do something, I think, which is very important for degrowth to make visible the invisible and uh, uh, to make visible all the beauty of everything which, which doesn't matter officially in this model of society, but which are maybe the most important and, 
Confinement was also a time where we could see how important what Cargonomia is doing, but not only Cargonomia, a lot of other groups, a lot of other partners, and people like us from all around the world, because I think there are a lot of creativity and wonderful projects like ours all around the world. And we could see how important it is, and unfortunately, how in this economic system we are relying on right now and we have to dismantle, um, how it is uh, not counting. And uh, with Cargonomia, we try to experiment alternative ways of life to show to the people that we can do differently and also to show that in doing it like that, we enjoy a lot, we have a lot of fun, we have a lot of uh, uh, good time. We do some time and we work hard. We, we also had sometimes some difficulties because uh, very often I run out of money, so like most of my partners and so on. But as we have a strong community around us, we never have stress and we always enjoy the hard task. And uh, no, we're happy that uh, the coronavirus is going down and on the weekend we will have some uh, activities. So uh, very soon I will, uh, we will have to stop the discussion. I will have time to eat before joining the friends and to ride bicycle to the north of Budapest, next to Saint André in the mountains, where there is a small degrowth utopia where we organized last year the first degrowth festival and we had to postpone it this year because of coronavirus. Tomorrow we will have a workshop in one of our garden, which is uh, reflecting on the commons. It's an open garden, open to everybody. Uh, based on urban agroforestry in Zuglo, and we will have a workshop on art and gardening. And uh, so a lot of fun like that. And Carbonomia, it's about having a lot of fun like that and, and being sustainable. It's something we don't speak so much anymore because it's something we, we are, uh, which, which is so much obvious that it's not the most important, but also to be solidar, to be convivial, and uh, to be autonomous and resilient. Yeah, I think the whole way that um, a formation like Karganomia acts to, in being a social centre as well, in being a place where people can find out more about degrowth um, in a very active kind of way, but can also experience uh, politics in a different way or sharing power in a different way, uh, deepening democracy so that they can actually see that even though they may have just arrived, people actually listen to what they have to say because people just coming in and not knowing something can actually have amazing insights that are really useful to those people who are doing things and can't see themselves as easily. Yeah, and for us, it's more like a showcase. And the force of Cargonomia is not the number of vegetable boxes we are able to distribute with our cargo bike every week. We don't want to grow with that, but it's how with few boxes, you can change the world in inspiring people. And uh, Cargonomia, from this point of view, is also about, uh, it's also about uh, uh, influencing the political debates, changing the mindset of the people. So we have also educational projects. We work a lot with younger generation, but uh, also adults, because uh, we speak about it in the book. We have to uh, discuss in school. We have to rethink our approach of uh, education, which is for uh, everybody. Uh, we also uh, uh, have a research project, you know, the book of colleague action research. So we try to make a type of inclusive research where you don't have any more the expert sitting on his uh, uh, chair and observing the people doing the things, but we are all involved and we are all co-constructing uh, uh, research and reflecting on what we experience, what's working, not working, where we fail, where we were good, where we, are, we, still are, we still have to work on, and so on and so on. And, uh, and also, on, we try to make um, political uh, activism. And it's really, again, based on what we spoke uh, a bit before about how to change the world without taking power. I really believe much more in the force of uh, somehow putting pressure on decision makers than trying to be a decision maker, than trying to be uh, elected. And it's a type of debate what I, I have and we have with degrowth and municipalist movement, which is, I think, uh, flourishing and uh, quite inspiring for degrowth as well. And, uh, and for example, there were a lot of debates uh, around the municipal election in Budapest and also around the municipal election in France, what I was participating and so on, which was like, do we create uh, a list of citizens to participate in the election? 
what some of my friends did, and it's a wonderful story, but when you enter into the institution, the beginning of the problems is huge. Uh, there was a, another type of strategy, what I much prefer, how you can interfere in this political debate during the framework of a political campaign and try to create strong uh, forces, citizen forces, to put pressure on whoever is elected to after implement, push them to implement a diverse political agenda. So it's more the strategy what we tried to implement with Cargonomia and some friends in Budapest, but it's not easy either. But we have now a friend at the City Hall of Budapest and we try to bring projects and to put pressure to uh, step by step uh, influence the policies in, within the city based on our low scale experience. So it's also about uh, transforming the society based on principle of small is beautiful, based on the principle to don't grow, but somehow to influence, to extend. Um, and that's why also the idea of not a movement, but a network uh, for degrowth is very important. So the idea is like you, you add more and more and more nodes to the network and, uh, and also a plur, plur, pluriversalism within the nodes, a large diversity of nodes. And the more diversity you have within the degrowth networks, and also no limits who is degrowth, not degrowth. We don't really know, but what makes it meaningful is if you still have the contact and the debate and the cooperation and sometimes the critiques between each node going on and so on. And it's what we try to do here with Carbonomia in our very small scale, connected to a lot of other wonderful projects. Well, um, we're sort of moving towards the end of our session now. And I was thinking that maybe just talking a bit about the International Degrowth Conference, which of course has been um, cancelled or at least partially put online, part, you know, um, maybe you can talk a little bit about, because you were very involved with the Manchester Conference, um, yeah. what has happened and what we can look forward to in the future. Yeah, unfortunately, we had to redesign uh, all our conferences. So the International Degrowth Conference, the first one started in 2008 in Paris, and it's when we translated Degrowth into English, and it became a, an international uh, debate and network. And since then, every two years, we, we had the one International Degrowth Conference, so it's been a uh, uh, Barcelona, Venice, Montreal, Leipzig, Budapest, Malmö, uh, we had one also uh, in the EU Parliament in Brussels, one about Global North, Global South dialogue, which was really about radical critiques to development and to decolonize the Western imaginary in Mexico City. And this year we were supposed to have two conferences, the International Joint Degrowth International Society of Ecological Economics Conference in Manchester, which was planned in, in September, and unfortunately we have to postpone it. And another one which was planned in June, end of May, beginning of June in Vienna. And Vienna decided to move online because it was impossible for them to postpone. And uh, they made an amazing, but also somehow dystopic uh, <laughs> work in uh, uh, bringing together for four days, thousands of people from all around the world, around a lot of round table, book presentation, type of workshop and whatsoever. So it's been a, Fantastic to see the enthusiasm about that. I didn't enjoy it so much because I would have rather spent more time outside in the garden or riding bicycles and to sit on in front of the computer. But that's the world we have to live with nowadays. And it was amazing to see the great enthusiasm about it and, and um, how much fantastic work the Vienna Local Organizing Committee put on board. And for Manchester, we decided to postpone the conference to next July. So the conference will take place. Hopefully we will be after COVID-19 or we will be able to, to go to UK, even if UK is now out of, uh, of, uh, of Europe. So it will be more difficult to get the right to, to travel there and so on. But in UK, I could see, uh, because I spent a week to prepare the conference in last autumn, I could see wonderful uh, dynamics around the conference. Also uh, this wonderful movement like Extinction Rebellion, which started there. And uh, in Manchester, you also have a fantastic, like everywhere, network of local initiatives about transition Manchester, about, um, about uh, uh, steady state uh, economy and et cetera, et cetera. So 
people are waiting for welcoming us there. And uh, even if we cannot all go there, which is maybe not uh, uh, desirable, we can have a balance between more online and local uh, conference and so on. I think it will be really, really wonderful. But very important, um, still we will organize something in September because we think that we should uh, make the debates go on and there will be a series of five symposium uh, discussion in September. Uh, what we are now co-constructing, mostly reflecting, and finally we didn't do much today, but we can uh, do it later, mostly reflecting on uh, the COVID-19 crisis and the uh, unfortunate, unfortunately upcoming, quite likely to happen, uh, upcoming uh, uh, depression or economic crisis and uh, the terrible consequences. And also parallelly to that, a strong political crisis. I mean, we can see in the UK or in the US a global situation in politics. And so on. So the idea is to reflect on that. And uh, next year, just after Manchester, we will also have the next international degrowth conference because we decided to move to uh, every two year conference to a yearly conference. So uh, we were a bit in trouble. So in end of August, we will have the Hague conference. But I think it's wonderful because uh, our experience proved that the more conference we have, the more people. We have because it's uh, not about growing, it's not about bringing everybody together in the same place, it's about a network and to add always one more node to the network. So next year we will have two strong nodes, one in Manchester and one in, uh, in The Hague in, uh, in Netherlands. And both the countries are somehow places, degrowth conferences and degrowth was not developed so much yet in the debate. So we are expecting, we are waiting for that uh, with a high enthusiasm. Well, I think we're going to have to wrap now. Yeah. And uh, I just want to thank all of the people who've participated in this. It's been really good to get the questions to um, make us feel confident that we're actually addressing uh, what people are really interested in. Exactly. So uh, you can already pre-order the book and support our publisher and uh, stay tuned to uh, see the next uh, steps about the books and also uh, about around degrowth. And uh, what is really good, I think, that uh, not only our book is about to be published, but we have a lot of other friends uh, publishing books about degrowth this year. And uh, I had the opportunity to read some of them, not all of them yet. And uh, what I found, and I think you too, Anitra, you read some of them, that mm -hmm. all these books are really complementary. Yeah. And they are somehow converging in the approaches. So there is really strong pillars constructed on degrowth about what is degrowth and what do we co-construct together. But also they are uh, offering uh, different angles, different approaches, different debates, and also addressing to a, a different public. And what uh, degrowth has to do is to be everywhere and connect the dots between the different uh, group of people and questioning uh, degrowth. So thanks everybody for attending to uh, our conversation. Thanks a lot Anitra for this wonderful journey we are going through together and, yeah. and uh, with, uh, uh, with uh, cooperation for this book and uh, uh, keep on going with the debate and now we will go to ride bicycle. Yeah. Bye-bye.